I, I worked for Trav for about six years, and then I went out to the Fallbrook campus, and I was a high school pastor out there for about seven and a half. Um, and now I'm back on the Vista campus. I've been married for nine years, have two kids of my own. And I teach the um, sex and intimacy class uh, in our preparing for marriage class um, several times throughout the year. So all that to say... That doesn't mean that I'm not, like, really, really nervous to get up here and talk about sex with a bunch of eighth-grade girls. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that I can explicitly, meaning clearly and in great detail, explain to you what the Bible has to say about sex. And hopefully, my prayer for all of you would be that we can treat this topic with the respect that it deserves, because I think it's an amazing thing. And, and hopefully, you leave with a much better understanding of not just what the Bible has to say about sex, but how sex actually works and its purpose. Sound good? Cool. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for this incredibly strange, unique, but amazing opportunity to stand on this stage and um, share with these young ladies uh, what your intent and your design for sex and intimacy is. And so I would just pray right now that you would empty me of myself that you would speak clearly to these students, that the Holy Spirit would work, and that you would quiet their hearts and allow them to hear what you want to share with them this evening. We love you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, Genesis chapter 1. I've got a lot to say. I'm going to talk quickly. If you have a question, you can, you can text the number. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God creates everything. And he starts to describe as he's creating things what it looks like. It says that he, he created light. And he saw that it was good. He separated the ground from the sea. He saw that it was good. Vegetation, it was good. Creatures, it was good. Then he gets to man, male, mankind. He finishes and he says, it's not good. Not that he's knocking the men, but he says, this isn't finished. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. And it's not until he finishes creating woman that he says, this is very good, which is a huge compliment to all of you, right? You made it. Good job. Interestingly enough, I think sometimes we forget that God created man and woman in the garden, and he made them completely naked. And the first command that he gave them was to have sex. That's actually right. He said, be fruitful and multiply. God says, hey, yeah, you can pray, read your Bible. It doesn't exist yet. Uh, whatever, think sweet thoughts. No, he says, here's what I want you to do. I made you without clothes. I just want you to enjoy each other. You've been united. You've been made one flesh, the first marriage. He says, now go and enjoy each other. Enjoy what you have to, to offer each other. Be fruitful, fill the earth, and subdue it. You're in charge. We go on uh, into 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read through it as quickly as I can. Uh, it's a very famous passage about married life. It says this, I'm starting in verse 1. It says, it's, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Did you know this was in your Bible? Fun stuff, right? The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, yea, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I. He's talking about being single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say to this, I say this, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do, but if you can't control yourselves, you should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. I think we're all familiar with what that feels like, right? To burn with passion. God actually designed you to desire sexual intimacy, and he created this as a gift. It really is a gift that God wants to bless you with. And so if that's where we started, I think the first question worth asking is, how did we get to the point that we're at right now? Because the world would define sex in a completely different way. And I would simply say this. It's really simple. Sin completely corrupts, and corrupts completely. So it ruined mankind, it destroyed the earth, and it ruined every gift that God gave us. That's a fun sound. 
So think of any gift that God has given you, and if you want to do a fun little science experiment right now, you could raise your right hand. Good job. Congratulations. So what exactly happened there? Your brain fired off a bunch of electrons to your, the muscles in your arm and told them to go up, right? But before that, your conscious, whether you want to call it your spirit or your soul, willed that action into being. In other words, if you stop and think for just a moment, you're not your body, you're not your heart, you're not your brain. You are a spirit that has full access to this gift. God gave you this gift. He gave you your arms so that they could serve other people. He gave you your knees so that you could bow down and, and pray to him. He gave you a voice so that you could worship him. He gave you words so that you could evangelize and tell people about Jesus Christ. And what do we wind up doing with those gifts? Let's just be honest for a minute. We take our body and we use it not to serve God. We use it to serve ourselves, right? Therein lies the treason of sin, that we take something God gives us and we turn it on its own selfish end. And in the same way, we've done the exact same thing with sex. God gives us a gift and we twist it into a selfish act. So I want to I want to break down real quickly for you how we use how we use sex for our own selfish gain and how God would desire us to use sex. Um First and foremost, let's just get this out of the way. The most common selfish act that we use sex for is to achieve physical gratification. Why? Because sex feels really good. Amen. <laughs> if you don't know that, good. If you don't know that, trust me, it feels great. It's incredible. It's an amazing thing. God wrote that into the code of sexual intimacy, and what we do is we take that piece of the puzzle and we say, I think I just want to opt for that. In the same way that you could take the good book, right? And if you wanted, you could rip out all the pages that you don't like, and you'd have maybe 15 pages about how uh, it's good to love each other and everybody's cool and all that good stuff, right? So we take sex and we make it our own thing. We use it to achieve physical gratification. We use it to feel good away about the way that we look. We use it to validate a relationship, right? So if, if I can be very serious with you for a, for a moment, in high school, I saw a lot of young men and women would get to a point in their relationship where they felt like, in order for us to know that we care about each other, we need to validate this. We need to prove to each other that we're committed and we need to have sex. And I would say another super common one is so that we feel loved, so if sex is a gift of intimacy that God gives us, well, then you are hardwired to desire it, to feel valued from getting and receiving it. And so we can take that piece out of the puzzle and say, I want attention. I want to feel loved. I'm going to give myself sexually to my boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it may be, and it is going to make me feel valued. Problem is, that is not how God set sex up. He uses it for a couple different things. The first one, most obviously, and perfect segue, thank you, Shara. He uses it to make babies, right? The first commandment was be fruitful and multiply, right? And so very obviously, one of the most basic, simple commands of sex is God says, I want you to rule and reign in this earth, and I want you to populate it. And so one of the purposes that God writes into sex and intimacy is to have children. Another one is to glue husband and wife together. So it's this bond that only they get to share, right? So if you think of your closest friendships, you've got inside jokes. You've got secret handshakes. <laughs> You're doing them right now, right? You've got trust. You've got intimacy. You've got life experiences. You have all these things. Sex would be the maximum of that idea, that it would be the deepest level of intimacy to be shared with the person that you consider to be the closest to you. Hey, Shara, can you do me a favor? I've got a bottle of water back there, and because I'm talking about sex to a bunch of eighth grade girls, my mouth is drying out so incredibly fast. I can just feel... Thank you. Okay, better. Better. Whoo! It's hot up here. We should turn the AC on too. And in a very real way, God says, I'm going to use that to, to, to unite you for how long? 
throughout high school, right? Throughout your four years of college, your five, your seven years of college, whatever, how long you go to college. Maybe you're a doctor, right? No, he says, I'm going to use this bond to unite you for life. That is the point, that it would be between one man and one woman. Genesis actually describes it as the uniting, the coming together to becoming one, that this would be the strongest adhesive that we know about. It is dangerously strong. And so he uses that to say marriage is going to be incredibly difficult, it's going to be incredibly hard, and it is going to be one of the longest commitments that you'll ever make. I want to bless you with an adhesive that is going to hold this union together if you treat it respectfully. The other use of sex is, is to build intimacy and trust between a, between a husband and wife. So I'll share with you, I would say, what I value and appreciate in my intimacy with, with my own spouse. So please don't giggle and laugh at me. I'm, like, proud of these things. The first one is this. I feel special because I'm the only man that's ever seen her naked. That's a beautiful thing, right? I'm super proud of that. I also know that moving forward, I'll be the only man that sees her naked. That, that instills in me value. That makes me feel proud. That makes me feel like a man. I feel masculine because I'm the only one that can satisfy her in that way. Okay, so I may be a jerk to her. I may, uh, we may get in a big argument and she says, you just don't understand me right now. You know, I'm going to talk to my best friend or whatever because you're not hearing what I'm saying. Um, she can go out with her girlfriends and have a great time, but I know that in that world, it is just the two of us. I'm the only one that, that can, can please her in that way. How many of you are Bachelor fans? So, so herein lies the problem of the fantasy suite. This was designed to be something special, wasn't it? Well, I'm not knocking The Bachelor, although I should. <laughs> Okay, I watch it, right, guilty pleasure. Watch it with my wife. Herein lies the problem of the fantasy suite. God designed it to be a special, unique piece between one man and one woman, and we get to this evening where everyone is losing their mind. Why? Jealousy is running rampant. Everyone's stressed out because it has lost that special purpose. I would say I also feel known and accepted because she's seen me naked, and she loves me still. I know that sounds silly, but she has seen me entirely for who I am. I have stood in front of her completely naked, and she loves me. So she has accepted me entirely. How many of you could say right now that you have a friend that knows you fully for who you are, that you have a parent that fully understands you? One of the most beautiful things about marriage is, and this is missed. I mean, there are adults that don't get this. Marriage gives you an opportunity to be fully known fully exposed, unlike any other relationship in the world, to say, here I am, warts and all, and for someone to say, I love you still. That is effectively biblical love, is it not? That's the way that God views you. God sees you at your lowest. He sees when you lie. He sees when you do everything in, in the darkest hour, all those things, and he says, I still love you. That can only be found in marital love and intimacy. And then I would say, I feel accomplished because it has been incredibly hard. It has been incredibly hard to build, I would say, an amazing sex life, and I'm super proud of it. It's taken many years of frustration, confusion. I'm, I kid you not, there have been times where my wife and I have talked about our own sexual intimacy, and I'm like, I'm so excited that we're having this conversation, but I can't even look at you right now because it's just awkward for me. Like, I'm embarrassed, and I'm a goofball, and so I'm just going to stand over here and, like, tell you this and tell you that and all that stuff. It has been grueling, but it's been amazing. It really has. It's been this amazing piece. And so the, ac the action of sex is incredibly simple. All right, so look out in the natural world, and every animal knows instinctively how to do it. Right? Okay, if you have a dog, you know this. Right? <laughs> yep. If you have a boy dog, you're like, who taught him that? <laughs> right? How did he learn that? He instinctively knows how to commit <laughs> the act of reproducing. And yet that has nothing to do with sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is incredibly complicated. So much so that there is nothing like what you and your future spouse are going to have. Here's what I mean by that. 
you are a completely unique individual. You're a snowflake, right? There's nothing else out there quite like you. We've done studies on this till, you know, the cows come home, and even twins are so uniquely designed. Your experiences, your personality, your likes, your dis dislikes, all these things, you come together with another completely unique individual, and you create what I would call an unprecedented reaction. So there is, there is nothing like this, which, if you're taking notes, I would say one of the most beautiful things about that is that you do not have to practice because what you're creating is something brand new. One of the dumbest, stupidest ideas I've ever heard is, well, I just want to have sex in high school or in junior high so that when I get married, I'm really good. You know what I would liken that to? I would liken that to you having a best friendship, and then you move away, and it's time for you to make a new best friend. And you meet this girl that you think you have so many things in common with, and you're so excited, and you guys are going to be best friends, and you say, you know what? I don't need to get to know you. We don't really even need to talk. I'm not even really concerned about you because I already know how to be a best friend. So don't worry about it. I got this. That sucks. That's a crappy friend, right? And in the same way, if you think, I'm going to round up all this experience so that I can one day share it with my husband, I'm sorry, ladies, that is not how it works at all because what you and your husband are going to create is brand new. It is completely unprecedented. There is no rule book on exactly how it is that you come together and build trust and intimacy. Um, here's what I wrote down. I don't know if this is a good quote or not, so maybe don't write it down yet. Good sex is a lifelong journey of exploration and discovery designed for husband and wife. When you put it that way, you start to realize that one of the most amazing things would be for a man to stand on the altar one day and say, for the rest of my life, I'm going to pursue and discover the mystery of you. Is that not what you want? I'll tell you what, that's what my wife desires. That's how God pieced my wife's heart together in a way that she knows that for the rest of my life, as long as I'm here, I am so driven and passionate about discovering who she is as a woman. It's a, it's a completely amazing thing. And that's why, too, there's no such thing as casual sex. It doesn't exist. It would be, my, it would be like me saying, um, this is a casual grenade. I'm going to throw it into the audience, right? And it doesn't make any sense. Some people might get hurt, but no big deal. You'd say, why would you do that? That's incredibly dangerous. Well, it's just casual, all right? Or what if I told you, you know, the other day I had casual diarrhea. <laughs> is that a thing? It's not a thing, right? Describe to me casual diarrhea. Right? So describe to me casual sex. Describe to me in a way how you could dive into the deepest level of human intimacy with someone that you haven't fully committed your life to. No, no pun intended, but that sounds like a load of crap. It's casual diarrhea, right? It's not, it is not in any way a real thing. And I think when you understand the original, the original purpose of sex, you begin to see how quickly things can go wrong. And my hope is that for these next few minutes, I can unpack for you why it is that you see the way the world is working and you start to understand, oh, I see now why that's broken because people have twisted and abused the original purpose of sex. So, um, in the same way that a fire is really good in a fireplace and really bad outside of a fireplace, sex is really good in a marriage and it's really bad outside of a marriage, okay? So the walls and the grate and the brick, they keep the fire in its place so that it can do its intended job, keep us warm and create ambiance and all these beautiful things. And the marital vows and the commitment that, that are said not just to each other, but said to God, if you're not a Christian, then I would argue you, you do not play by the rules that God has set up. You are free, by God's standard, to abuse sex however it is that you want. But if you're a believer and you want to treat sex the way that it deserves to be treated, and ultimately, I would say, to actually find fulfillment in intimacy, you need to build those same walls, okay? So, without getting into too much detail, if trust, intimacy, commitment don't exist, if those three walls, okay, don't exist, then the fire spills out of the fireplace, and what is sex now? 
you've now exposed yourself to someone that you can't fully trust. All right? You've given yourself on the deepest level to an individual that you have not committed your life to, which means if they move on, who's to say how they're going to treat that experience? Right? It's lost its, its luster. It's lost its uniqueness. It's lost all of those things. I would also say that in the same way that driving is designed for a point in life, Sex is designed for a point in life. So maybe you're really good at driving. Maybe you crush it at Mario Kart, right? And you're like, hey, you know what I'm going to do? Instead of driving at 16, I'm going to start driving at 13. Is that a good idea? Yeah, it is. No, that's how you go to jail, right? What if you're really good at driving? Does it matter? It doesn't. Okay, what if you never get in an accident? Does it matter? It doesn't. You're breaking the laws by which driving works. You're making things inherently more dangerous, regardless of how good you think you are at driving or anything like that. I want to pause for just a second, and I want to address the fact that being a junior high pastor and a high school pastor for 15 years now, I fully understand that there's probably several of you in this room that are like, well, what if I've already experienced sex on some level? I've got really good news for you, okay? All you need to do is to turn around and repent to God. That's all you have to do. You're like, what? That sounds so, you just hyped this up so big, and now you're saying, all I need to do is turn around and repent and give my life to God and say that I want to commit to him now, and I no longer want to take part in this thing. I'd like to remind you or maybe tell you for the first time, your God does not make bad things good things. That's not what he does. Okay, when you get saved, you weren't a bad person and now you're a good person. No, you're still a jacked up person, but you're saved. All right? Grace, mercy, they reign in your life. He is risen, the blood of Christ. That's why we worship and celebrate. Like, we're sinners saved by grace. Your God doesn't take bad things and make them good. He takes dead things and he makes them alive. In the same way, if you have effectively killed your future intimacy... If you thought, oh my gosh, I've already given myself away. The uniqueness is gone. This, whatever it is, this gift that I could have given to my husband, it's gone. You, you, you serve a miracle-working God that is constantly making things new. That's what he's in the business of doing. If God can take your route that's destined to hell and reroute it to heaven, which is the most miraculous miracle of all time, it is a simple task for him to say, I'm going to take your broken, jacked-up view of relationships the mess that you've made of intimacy, and I can make it right again. I can completely reconcile it and save it. That's all that you need to do. I would say this. If you're there, I'm going to do my best to get you out to small groups so you can unpack. You're like, oh, my gosh, this is so overwhelming. So you can unpack some of this. I would say you might want to start having that conversation with a small group leader or a parent about what that process looks like, okay, because your God is mighty to save, absolutely 100%. Here's what I would say you should know. I'm almost done, I promise. If you allow God to give you value, you won't need it from anyone else. That almost sounds like bad news because it sucks. It's hard. I'm a guy. I'm a pretty confident guy standing up here with a microphone in my hand talking to a bunch of eighth grade girls about sex and intimacy. That's not easy, but it's like, hey, I'm a pretty confident guy. I'm still wildly insecure, and it is hard even for me sometimes to remember how it is that God sees me and how he views me. And when I forget those things, what do I do? I run to other places to get that attention, don't I? When I forget how God sees me, I need attention from my wife. I need attention from my kids. I need attention from my bosses, from my coworkers, all those things to remind me that I'm a good person. And God says, I love you the way that you are. All right? Practice that art. That will save you in the long run. Uh, Beauty really does lie in the eye of the beholder. The reason my best guy friend has been my best guy friend for my whole life has been that we never once fought over a girl right? We've known each other since second grade, and for whatever reason, we never went after the same girls. If we had, we would not be friends right now. He was the best man at my wedding. I was the best man at his wedding, and it was because I always, the girls he was into, I'm like, okay, cool, whatever. That's great, and the girls I was into, he's like, okay, cool, whatever. That's great. We never competed, and I want to tell you right now, the images that you see, the magazines at the stores and all that stuff, that is one perspective of what beauty is, But when I look at those, and this is just my opinion, so you need to understand it. You need to weigh it as all the same, the other opinions. When I look at those magazines, I think those those ladies need to eat a cheeseburger, all right? They're too skinny, okay? 
not for me. That's not to say that skinny girls are gross. That's simply to say that the way that you've been designed is beautiful. It truly is, 100%. I'm not cheesing you on that. I'm telling you as a man, we, especially in junior high, we're pressured to think a certain thing is, is attractive because we're inundated with it. We as guys in junior high, we expose ourselves to those magazines, Sports Illustrated for Men, pornography, all of those things, and we get this image in our head that we need to think these things are really attractive so that we can fit in. It's not true. It's simply not true. Um, your relational tombstone should read this. Give yourself fully to one man instead of partially to many. Waiting well honors God. It values self. It respects your future husband, and it builds self-trust. Don't play hard to get. Be hard to get, right? So if you're... Whew, all right, I had a couple of wows right there. Thank you. Um, if you are wrapped up in God, you will be so attractive to other guys because guys generally want to hunt. All right? If you expose yourself as a piece of meat, you may find yourself attractive to lazy guys, but most guys, and I hope I'm not mincing words here, want to pursue you. They want to go after you. They want to fight hard to win you. And one of the best ways to do that in a very real, authentic way is to get wrapped up in God. There was, a, there was a high school student in my high school ministry. It was so funny. We were doing this dating series, and she said, the only four men in my life right now are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there were so many guys that just by her not caring anymore, by her not being desperate, they were like, I am so attracted to her confidence because she doesn't need me. She's wrapped up in Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. Um, here's what you can do right now. You can practice patience. I just want to tell you, patience is really hard and it's not fun. All right? Any gymnasts in the room? I was a gymnast uh, in junior high. Gymnastics is really hard, but it's really fun. Any cheerleaders in the room? Okay, I was also a cheerleader, believe it or not. Five, six, seven, eight. Cheerleading. It's really hard, but it's really fun. The bad news is waiting is hard, and it's not fun, but it's worth it. It is absolutely worth it. Practice patience. Practice commitment. So you, you can do this right now. You can find good friends and keep them, all right? Find good friends and keep them. Here's what we do. We find friends, and everything's going really well, and then we find out, oh, they don't like the Jonas Brothers. Oh, my gosh. I'm done with you, right? Casual diarrhea, right? No, you can actually practice the art of working through relationships with your best friends. You can practice the art of working through relationships with your parents, and it will pay dividends when you're ready to get married because marriage is difficult, and you will have practiced the art of commitment. And I'll say this. I'll close with this because I think this is what young women need to hear right now. You need to practice the art of self-trust. And what I mean by that is you need to get to a point where you trust yourself. You can commit to yourself. So you should read the Bible and you should learn what it says. Don't assume that what I said, I read you a bunch of verses, I may have made them all up, right? You can't just take for granted what Shara says or what Trav says or what Taylor says or anything. Read the Bible, find out what it says, and do it. Because you will create a track record of committing to yourself and knowing that you can rely on yourself, all right? You, can't make, you cannot make promises to yourself if you can't keep promises with yourself. And if you haven't learned that art of trusting yourself, you're going to get into high school and you're going to say, you know what? I'm going to be abstinent. I'm going to put on a purity ring. And what will that mean? You will have not learned how to commit fully to yourself. The strength of any man or woman is their ability to follow through on their convictions to their God, their family, and their selves. So, last night, I don't want to spill the beans, but if you watch The Bachelor, listen, hey, stop, stop. I can do this. I think I can do this without getting tomatoes thrown at me. I think I can do it. Last night on The Bachelor, there was this amazing, I, I promise you I'm not going to ruin it, okay? I promise you. I'm going to set the stage but I am not going to tell you what actually happened. But there is an amazing moment that I think you two ladies are going to understand what I'm talking about where everything is going really well for this young lady who I think has strong convictions. And her dad jumps back into the picture, and he, in this amazing way, and I'm not going to tell you how it all pans out, in this amazing way, he reminds her 
of what's most valuable to her. From there, it gets pretty dramatic. But I think it's this beautiful thing that this woman, she knows. She knows what she wants, and she knows who she is, and she knows what she's looking for. And she gets caught up in the show. She gets caught up in all the fun dates and all that stuff, and she's reminded what she's all about. There's a lot of women on that show that don't even know what they want. They have never practiced self-trust, and they're along for the ride. So whatever Colton wants to do, it's the best idea. I love it. Oh, my gosh, so great. Colton, you're so good. You know, da 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 I'm challenging you to be a strong young woman. I'm challenging you to know what you believe and to practice it so that you can trust yourself. Can I pray for you all? And then if we have time for questions, great. Hey, God, these ladies are here, and the fact that they're here on a Tuesday night inside of a church building desiring to know you more and desiring to have stronger relationships is an amazing thing. I would simply ask that this would be the first of many steps that they take in moving towards what you have called them to sexual intimacy. I pray for all of their futures. I pray for all their future, future spouses. I pray that one day they all have marriages that shine your light in this community around the world. We love you. Amen. Um. Are you brave? If you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. If you don't, I totally understand. Yeah. Kissing is not a form of sex. Um, I, I, that's a great question. I would say that sex, um, I'm not going to define it for you. I'm going to let your parents do that. Um, I would also say this. If you have any kind of a relationship with your parents, let me just tell you as a parent, those relationships are hard. They're not easy. Bless your parents by saying, can we just have an awkward conversation about this? Some of you are like, your skin is crawling right now. But <laughs> here's the thing. You, it is impossible for you to have a not awkward conversation with your parents about sex. They're your parents, okay? Sex is the reason you exist, right? Like, <laughs> gross, right? So I think that is a bridge that you can create. I would say as far as kissing goes, um, when, I'm trying to think of, I have a two and a half year old daughter, when would I be cool with her kissing a boy? So I would say never, no, <laughs> 14, I don't know, I honestly don't know. You know what it would be? It would be her level of maturity, I think. Kissing is not a sin. Um, is it a good decision? So if you said, can I eat my lawnmower? I'd say, it's not a sin. Is it a good idea? That is up to you, the person that you're dating, and your parents to define when you personally are ready. But, and again, I'm being really hard on you right now. If your focus is how soon can I kiss, I question what your focus is. Why isn't your focus, how do I focus more on reading the Bible? How do I focus more on my healthy relationships? I know that's like such a cheap answer, but it's the truth. Like if you're just thinking about, <gasps> when do I get to kiss a boy? You need to rewire yourself so that you don't care anymore about when you can kiss a boy. Also, the boys your age right now, they smell. They're weird. And they smell. Those are the three things. <laughs> Any other questions? The, what's the best Bible verse to describe the idea of sex? So uh, Genesis chapters 1 and 2 spell out where it is to be contained entirely in marriage. Um, I wish I could quote this off the top of my head, but there is a psalm that David says, above all, you need to guard your heart. That's so good. That's like you as a young woman, your heart is so valuable. It is so amazing. It's so beautiful, and you need to protect it. And you need to be waiting for God to bring you a man that's going to help protect your heart. I'm so proud that God has placed me in a position that he thinks I'm worthy enough to protect the heart of my wife and my daughter. Your heart is so valuable. It's the only one that, that God gives you, and it's entirely unique. Why would you gamble it on, on, a, on a relationship in junior high? Why would you do that? Why would you risk it? 
So uh, that verse has very little to do with sex and intimacy, and yet I think it has so much to do with sex and intimacy. You need to be so protective right now of your heart, and that's why, because you're just in an age where you, you don't have a man to help you do that. You have something better. You have Jesus Christ who wants to protect your heart, you know? Next, yeah. To have sex on your wedding night. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that, was that your question? So I, I, I actually said that jokingly. I woke up the next day. I got married June 10th, June 11th, 2010. I woke up the next day a virgin. <laughs> wow. Lame. Wow. Boo. So I'll, t I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what that looked like. I saved myself for marriage. I don't get to claim that. I wasn't a Christian. I tried to lose my virginity in high school. I was lame. Couldn't do it. All right? Yeah, tried my best. But God protected me. He kept me safe. I gave him my life my senior year in high school. And for whatever reason, he had kept me safe prior to that. Like, I consider it a total blessing that he did. So I was a virgin. My wife was a virgin. Again, without going into great detail, sex is incredibly complicated. And what you expose yourself to is not sex. If you've ever seen, heard of anything pornographic, that's not intimacy. That's not two people coming together and caring about each other. It's two actors working for a paycheck. And so I promise you, I promise you, you have no idea what it looks like until you're there. And that's why when you say, I'm committed to you, I'm going to see you naked, we're going to fumble through this, and we're going to build something together, that is the safest foundation for building sexual intimacy. So, um, yeah, when are, you, when are you ready? You're ready on your wedding night to start that journey. It's that simple. If one of you is super stressed out, if one of you is really anxious, if one of you has a history of sexual abuse or something like that, dang, that, that plays such a role. How dare anyone say, well, I demand sex on our wedding night. If someone said that to you, is that a loving husband? No. If you said that to your husband, you better have sex with me tonight. Like, what? No. So to answer your question, I would say you're ready on your wedding night, and yet you are starting a very sensitive, uh, very passionate, very intense, long-term journey. A meeting of your time with questions. Is that? All right. One more. Yeah. Um, how does sex and having children influence your life? So when I got married, things changed dramatically. When I had kids, I realized things had not changed that dramatically when I got married. Kids flip your world completely upside down. Marriage flips your world upside down, but married ladies in the house, like, you know, kids is like a game changer. Like, if you, when, you, when I got married, I was like, ah, oh, like, I can still hang out with my friends and do whatever, we could stay up late. I'm like, it's, guys, it's like 45 minutes past my bedtime. I have two kids, right? I'm exhausted all the time. So uh, another great point to that is you will never be ready for these. You'll never be prepared for these steps, all right? You'll never have it all figured out. You'll never have all the answers. You'll never read all this literature and understand all these things. I'm so prepared to be married. I'm so prepared to have kids. But you can be ready. You can say, it's time. It is my time. And, and God will make that very clear to you if you are walking with him. All right, thanks, y'all. I appreciate it. Yeah.